Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the media and how they cover certain events such as wars or trade agreements. My guest is an expert on both. My guest today is Mr. John R. Rick MacArthur, who is an award-winning journalist and author. He is also the president and publisher of Harper's Magazine. Mr. Rick MacArthur, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Delighted to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. We're going to get into some really interesting topics here in a minute. We're going to start, start off with another interesting topic, and that is Harper's Magazine. Harper's is, as I recall, one of the oldest magazines in the United States. When was it launched, and what is the basic mission of Harper's? Well, Harper's was founded in 1850 uh, by the Harper Brothers, who had a, already had a considerable publishing business. And actually, to tell you the truth, it was started for a purely commercial re reason, which was to take up downtime on the book press. And they thought they could promote their books with a serious or a fairly serious literary magazine. So Harper started out as a, as a literary magazine that took a lot of stuff from Europe, mm -hmm. particularly, uh, and was intended to promote the Harper and Brothers line of books. And over the years, it became a huge success. It was one of the first, ma <laughs> it was the closest thing we had to a mass circulation uh -huh. national magazine in the 19th century. And eventually, it evolved into a kind of a magazine of, of reference, more literary than political. Uh, it's the second oldest magazine in the country. Mm -hmm. Scientific American is the only older magazine. But in the 20th century, it became a uh, much more than just a literary magazine. It became kind of the, the New York Times op-ed page. Uh, it's, it was the equivalent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in 1947, um, Henry Stimson wrote a piece in Harper's Magazine justifying the bombing of Hiroshima. He felt that was the place he had to do it mm -hmm. because he was under siege. He was being criticized. And this was sort of like the equivalent of writing a, a New York Times op-ed page mm -hmm. a piece. So today, we're literary political, journalism, photojournalism. We do every, we're sort of the classic general interest magazine. And so unbeknownst, they launched a movement <laughs> and it yeah. actually took hold. Yeah. yeah. Well, our viewers can go to yeah. www.harpers.org and right. get more information on your magazine. Let's right. get into these topics. You have written, you, you're an award-winning journalist right. and author. You've written several books over the years and <clears throat> one, one of your, fir or the first book was Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the Gulf War. That was back in 1991, 92. Right. What, what exactly was the thrust of that particular book? Well, I got interested in the uh, build-up to the Gulf War because mm -hmm. there was a whole argument about censorship uh, that grows out of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, you'll recall, was uh, uncensored. Uh, Lyndon Johnson never imposed censorship, mm -hmm. and reporters could go pretty much anywhere they wanted on the battlefield. They just hit, hitch a ride on a helicopter, and they'd show up for the battle, and they'd sometimes show up for some very ugly stuff that was very upsetting to the Johnson administration, but they didn't censor the reporters. Going into the Gulf War, uh, General Schwarzkopf and others in the, uh, in the, and other people in the Bush administration felt it was essential to control the press. They referred to it literally as the Vietnam Syndrome. They didn't want to be caught out or embarrassed by any ugly pictures coming from the battlefield. So they organized a censorship uh, a system which I'm sad to say the American media signed on to stupidly, and which set the precedent for all future uh, mm -hmm. uh, war coverage in the United States. But along the way, because I'm an investigative reporter by training, I, I came up through r newspaper reporting, mm -hmm. not advertising like a lot of publishers, and the uh, thing that interested me most was the selling of the Gulf War, uh, and because they were having a hard time selling it to Congress. It was a close vote on whether to authorize the invasion or the eviction of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, which is what it was about. So uh, as I got into it, I learned more and more about how he was selling it. And the, the big story that came out of it was the baby incubator atrocity mm -hmm. that never happened. If, any, right. if, if people with long memories, I remember that George Bush pounded on the table and said, uh, they're pulling babies out of incubators and scattering them on the floor like, like uh, uh, firewood. And by the end of this, uh, the claim was that more than 100 babies had been pulled from incubators in Kuwait City hospitals by right. Iraqi soldiers and killed. It was entirely false. And I found out how they uh, uh, fixed it. What they did was they, 
got the daughter of the uh, Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, Naira Al Sabah, mm -hmm. to testify in front of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus and say that she had personally witnessed this. But she was the daughter of the, <laughs> the ambassador to Washington. Right, had a she was in interest. Washington at the time. She had yeah. a, also had a vested interest. This is how they sold the war. This is how uh, they pushed yeah. a few reluctant votes into the into the yes, we should uh, invade I, camp. I, I do remember that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure many, many people in this country do. That that was concocted by a PR firm, was it not? Yeah. And that seems like that's the way the governments are starting to do it when they go to war. You, or certain entities that want to go to war, hire right. PR firms, and they spin up all these myths and uh, really uh, fabrications. You, you were talking yeah. too about the media. Is this the first time we've had what, what they called the embed? The media yeah. were embedded with units that would go out into the field. Well, they would send certain media people with certain units and they would interact with them and really almost become part of that unit. Yeah, although in World War II, to be fair, uh, uh, reporters were actually in the army. They were they were mm -hmm, right. they were soldiers and in Korea too. And in Korea too. So, uh, what we're talking the comparison we're making is really between Vietnam and mm -hmm. and nowadays. Although, the coverage in World War II, even with the conscription of reporters, because they were cons in effect conscript conscripted mm -hmm. into the army, was still better than the Gulf War mm -hmm. because. They did get to see things, and they did get to report them, if not right after the battle, then, you know, a week or two after the battle. And we had a good historical archive of what happened in World War II because people mm -hmm. were allowed to witness the battle. Uh, and so, but Vietnam upset the power structure so badly, upset the Defense Department, uh, uh, all the services, and it became a kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a, an urban legend that the press lost Vietnam, that it so demoralized the American yeah. people with ugly images that uh, we gave up, which is absurd. We lost because we lost militarily to the Vietnamese communists. They won the war, or they, they, they fought us in a war of attrition that we eventually gave up uh, on. And in fact, uh, the vast majority of images from Vietnam, despite all the horrible things you remember seeing, mm -hmm. were not so horrible. Uh, and I've, I cite all the studies, uh, the academic studies that show that in, in my in book. book right? yeah. one, one aspect of that war that has received yeah. considerable, well, it was considerable attention over the past several years is how President George Herbert Walker Bush went to the United Nations. He actually went through the legal international yes. channels, went to the Security Council, got a Security Council resolution, mobilized, I think, 34 countries to be part of a coalition. And you had countries like Egypt, just a real cross-section, right. and went in and they ousted Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. We're going to talk about the, the second <laughs> major yeah. war, 2003, uh, two, yeah, 2003, but we'll, uh, th that is really the way if, uh, some people will say we shouldn't be doing war any place, right. any time, right. but to do something like that, they really have to use the legal international machinery, do they not? Well, they uh, should. To go through the UN. They should, and, and the, the Bush administration, uh, uh, apart from the, the propaganda campaign, which was pretty sleazy, uh, they played it straight. They argued their case uh, in front of the UN, and they argued their case in front of the US Senate, and they uh, persuaded enough other countries that, that the rule of international law was important enough to commit resources and soldiers to the eviction of, uh, of Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Now. There are other things going on in the Bush administration which were not, which, which were not so principled, like uh, uh, arguments about how much oil uh, played, played into it, how much they wanted uh, to punish Saddam for having stolen Kuwaiti oil. It wasn't all about principle. But by and large, they did it the correct way, uh, legally. Oh, now, if we could, which we don't do anymore, we we stopped. We stopped <laughs> even following the international rules. Exactly, which brings us to yeah. 2003. Right. Which, as we shift gear to gears right. to that war, that one's one that looked at as exactly the wrong way to do it because the United States and a very small coalition of countries, 25 or 30, whatever, r did an end run around the United Nations, even though that they, uh, they had first gone to the UN. How does that contrast with what happened? Well, in you 1990, have, you have uh, George Bush, the son, uh, uh, essentially acting unilaterally in violation of international law. But it's important to point out that the precedent was set in Kosovo. Uh, the Clinton administration bombing of uh, Belgrade with NATO. with NATO, in concert with NATO, 
uh, and this is Helmut Schmidt who, who mm -hmm. pointed this out to me, the former chancellor of uh, West Germany, uh, that uh, unless you're attacked, uh, uh, you have no, there's no justification for launching a, a, a bombing strike against mm -hmm. a, a foreign country. Uh, we launched a unilateral, a preemptive strike against uh, Serbia on the grounds that we said a genocide was in, was in process or was about to begin. It hadn't begun and it never uh, happened the way they said it was going to happen. Uh, but it was a preemptive bombing, and that actually the, the Bush lawyers and the Bush strategists mm -hmm. were copying to some extent the Clinton initiative in Kosovo. Now, George Bush, the, 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 the uh, son, decided he would try to get UN approval, but as you know, France refused. Mm -hmm. They vetoed it in the Security Council. And uh, uh, so he said, we're just going to do it anyway. We're going to go to war anyway. And we know very well that it was based on fraudulent evidence. Our argument was based on fraudulent mm -hmm. evidence that Saddam Hussein had an atomic bomb ready to be used. But even if he'd had an atomic bomb, uh, 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 in those days it was understood among international law experts that a preemptive strike was illegal under international law, particularly when you didn't have coalition or UN Security Council support, which, which they did not have. Just said, we're going to do it anyway mm -hmm. with Tony Blair. And they did an end run. And we're going to talk yeah. about Tony Blair in just a moment. That's a very good point. I'm right. glad you brought that up. Right. But you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you are interested in uh, br really using these shows and sharing them with uh, people in your community or wherever it might be, and if you're involved with a, a community access television station, a PBS station, perhaps an educational institution that has a television hookup, or even if you just have a website, mm -hmm. feel free to download the programs. They're provided free of charge at no cost. Global Connections Television is a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. My guest today is Mr. Rick MacArthur, and Mr. Rick MacArthur is the uh, publisher and president of Harper's Magazine. Rick, we're talking about some very serious topics today, and before we get away from Iraq, I wanted to mention very quickly and get into trade, the uh, Chilcot Inquiry, a couple of, mm. really a couple of months ago now, the British released the Chilcot Inquiry. It went on for seven years, and it was really an extensive analysis of the, their involvement in the war, in uh, the Iraq War in 2003, which many people today view it as an illegal invasion of a sovereign country. No, uh, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. But the Chilcot Inquiry basically said Saddam Hussein did not pose a threat to the UK, that by doing an end run around the Security Council, the coalition, a small coalition, undermine the Security Council. Uh, pr then Prime Minister Tony Blair actually gave a blank check to George W. Bush to do what he wanted, more or less. Uh, should the United States have a Chilcot inquiry? Because we're hearing so much misinformation about this issue. Should we do something like that to go back and look at it, review it, study it, and find out what went wrong? Because if you trace it back today, probably 90, 95% of all of the problems in the Middle East, minus the Israeli-Palestinian issue, can be traced to 2003 and the invasion of Iraq. Absolutely, we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, like they had in South Africa. I mean, <laughs> right. we have, I, in That's a lot right. of different areas. After apartheid. I mean, we never really had one on Vietnam either, for that, mm -hmm. for that matter, uh, although you have the Pentagon Papers, thank God. But the, 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 the problem with the U.S. Congress is, is they want it to go away. They don't want to revive mm -hmm. bad memories. The politicians who were involved in the war, supported the war, supported the invasion, and regret it, don't want people mm -hmm. reminded of how wrong they were. I mean, you had plenty mm -hmm. of evidence that uh, Saddam Hussein had nothing like what we were claiming he had. Uh, and it was on the record. Hans Blix and Mohammed mm -hmm. al-Baradei mm -hmm. were doing a very good job. Scott Ritter did his best, but there was uh, uh, an inquiry in process uh, which found no evidence that there was an imminent nuclear threat. And Saddam was certainly in no position to attack anybody. He was so weak his, mm -hmm. from sanctions in the 90s uh, imposed by Clinton. He had absolutely, he didn't have any, he didn't have any firepower. He didn't have any, he didn't have yeah. the army he'd had in 1991 when he invaded mm -hmm. Kuwait. So it was uh, absurd and 
yes, we should go back, it's outrageous, and we should go back and, and re-interview people while they're still alive. That's very true. And yeah. so often you hear today, yeah. especially on uh, news outlets like Fox and some of the others that just can't get the story correct, right. you hear that, well, everybody thought Saddam had weapons. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Dr. Hans Blix was yeah. one of them, and he knew he went in, he took the, obs the uh, verification team right. of the UN in there and came out with the conclusion that they did not, but the media paid attention to Hans Blix one day and then moved back to the PR firms and the people who were putting out misinformation, like Curveball and some of the other, the yeah. other people. Well, that Curveball, Curveball, <laughs> I think, was Dick Cheney. I think Ju Judith well, Miller's source on her right. famous Judith story Miller about the New York it. Times. The next, the next right. uh, thing you're going to see is a mushroom cloud. And Scooter Libby. And Scooter who Libby. Who those are, chief those of are staff. sources. That's and right. And that she's pretending they weren't, uh, or she's never admitted that they were. But Has even written a book yeah. <laughs> refuting yeah. it, but right. the book is in mostly, most yeah. cases incorrect. Well, we're believe. gonna run yeah. out of time. Right, I mean, right, we, right, we right. We'll have to have yeah. you back to talk about trade, okay. but we're gonna get yeah. into that. Uh, you've written another book, The Selling of Free Trade, NAFTA, Washington, and the Subversion of American Democracy. NAFTA was a big ticket item. Mm. It's very, uh, it's been discussed. It uh, got a lot of publicity back in 1996. Four, three. 93. Three, and when came the, online the, the 94. Fight was, the big That's fight right. was in 93, yeah. Uh, exactly. What, uh, what is the genesis of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and uh, what, uh, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? Well, they're, they're, it started with the Bush administration, Bush the father. He initiated it with Carlos Salinas, who was a very conservative, or what we call in economics, a liberal. He was a, he was a free market uh, president, uh, sort of right wing. And in Mexico, traditionally, has been run by left-wingers up to that point, and they had high tariffs. Now, Mexico was a weak player in the international economy and a very minor trading party, party with the United States. We had already had an agreement with the Canadians, mm -hmm. which is more logical because we, we have the same standard of living. But Mexico, in many parts of the country, is like a third world country with very low wage rates and so on. Now, American businessmen had already figured out that it was great to, to use Mexican labor where they could because it was so much cheaper than American labor. Bush comes along and says, look, we're going to codify this. We're going to create what in effect is an investment agreement to protect your assets in, in Mexico because they had a vivid memory, a corporate memory of the Mexican uh, uh, oil uh, mm -hmm. expropriation in 1938 by a left-wing Mexican president. A lot of American oil men were still angry and still very, very conscious of this expropriation. So they want to make sure that if we go in in a big way uh, to exploit the cheap labor, our investments are going to be protected and we're not going to get shaken <coughs> down by the local uh, political uh, uh, powers and so on and so forth. Because that was another routine part of, Mex of, of doing business in Mexico, was being shaken down all the time. They also wanted, they thought, to stabilize Mexico. Uh, by getting more dollars into the economy, kind of Americanize the Mexican economy. But really it was about mm -hmm. safely exploiting the cheap labor. And they came up with this cockamamie uh, uh, theory that the Mexicans would, 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 it would help grow exports from the United States to Mexico because we'd enrich Mexico and they'd be able to buy our stuff. But all it was finally was an attempt to take advantage of the cheap labor, and that's what mm. uh, Bush sold and then Clinton took over. Now, Bill Clinton's another story, because Bill Clinton, in theory, is a, at that point was a liberal Democrat, supported by the labor movement, but he saw a great opportunity to move uh, his party to the right, or at least closer to the interests of business, mm -hmm. a businessman who would contribute to his campaign. And that was his, I have to say, his main motivating force. This is, uh, plenty of people told me this at the time. The most important uh, was David Bonnier, uh, the minority whip from, uh, or majority whip at that point, uh, in Congress from Michigan. Said so he did it for the money. He did it for the fundraising. Mm -hmm. it not, it's not about free trade or anything like that. It's about uh, Bill Clinton uh, positioning himself politically. It's a ta it was a tactic. Now, unfortunately, the, the tactic led to massive industrial dislocation, hundreds of thousands of jobs moving to Mexico, like the Swing Line Stapler Company, which I follow in my book, and mm -hmm. the Auto Light Spark Plug Plant, which I've written about uh, uh, more recently in Fostoria, Ohio. Mm -hmm. You're talking about hundreds, thousands of workers losing their jobs. 
where they were making $18, $19 an hour and going to Mexico mm -hmm. where they'll do it for $2 an hour. And uh, uh, it's not just the people losing their jobs that are, are hurt, it's also the town. The tax revenue, tax base goes down, mm -hmm. schools can't hire teachers, the Little League can't get funded. All the sort of uh, infrastructure that comes with a big factory or several big factories in a town uh, just disappear. And that's, that's why a lot of people are very angry about NAFTA. Uh, the second part of it, the second leg of it is PNTR, Permanent Normal Trade Relations with China. That was Clinton's second big trade initiative, which was an attempt to get China or uh, an effort to get China into the World Trade Organization. By establishing permanent normal trade relations with China, they could join the WTO, which was also a kind of expropriation insurance like NAFTA protecting American investments abroad or in China. Mm -hmm. After all, China is a communist country. And so the question in, in an American businessman's mind was always, if I invest heavily in China, I love the cheap labor, but what if they get nasty and seize my assets? So this was also an effort to, to, to bring China into the world system. And the outflow of jobs to China was even more dramatic, uh, more spectacular after mm -hmm. PNTR was trade, uh, passed in 2000 than mm -hmm. NAFTA. Yeah. People talk about NAFTA, uh, uh, it's a slogan almost, but PNTR was, mm -hmm. was even worse for the American uh, uh, worker. Now for the hardest question in the last minute right. we have, right. we're going to have trade. It's yeah. going to happen. Sure. Countries are going to trade with each other. Globalization right. is taking place. What would the ideal trade agreement look like? The, as I understand, NAFTA, the, it was written primarily by the business community. They had the environmental and labor sidebars, which got ignored, right. as I understand it, right. over the years, which they should not have been ignored. But what would a really a good trade deal look like? We're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership right now, TPP, we're talking about the Transatlantic yeah. Partnership, the TAP. But what would a good trade deal look like in the last minute that we have. Well, we, we had, <laughs> the we hardest had, we, part. Well, we had one. We had the Canada-U.S. trade agreement that preceded which, which the- Which did what? Which mm -hmm. allowed uh, uh, lower tariffs between two countries with more or less equal standards of living and with equal uh, sort of interests in democracy and social mm -hmm. welfare, mm -hmm. although the Canadians are ahead of us on that. Uh, but it was between e it's more equal partners. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about exploiting Canadian labor or exploiting American labor. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, is again an effort to lock in safely low-wage manufacturing in Vietnam and Malaysia, where the labor rates, it's even cheaper mm -hmm. than in China. Labor rates are going up in China. American businessmen would like to be able to invest safely in Vietnam and Malaysia, where the, the, the labor rates are even lower. The labor is even cheaper. So uh, Obama, as a good centrist Democrat, a good Clintonian Democrat, and a, and a free trader, quote unquote, is, uh, is still pushing, you know, has, has been pushing for it uh, for uh, all, all, almost his entire administration. Uh, but it's not between equal partners. What you want is, uh, like the European Common Market, uh, the six original members of the European Common Market were more or less equal uh, in standards of living and in, in, and in political sort of sociology, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Once you start bringing in poorer countries in Eastern Europe, Greece, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, you run into tr uh, problems because you don't have harmonization between wages and social welfare. So inevitably, the richer countries are gonna step on the poorer countries and mm -hmm. take advantage of them. It doesn't help the poorer countries. Mexico's yeah. in terrible <coughs> shape still, mm -hmm. thanks to NAFTA. They yeah. lost, they've lost, their corn <coughs> industry, their corn farming has disappeared because of NAFTA. And of course, certain countries like Germany, Germany is one of the biggest, uh, most successful exporters right. in the world. They've maintained a high level, uh, high standard of living. They've maintained high wages for right. their employees. They're unionized to a large degree. They've shown they're really a model that a lot yeah. of countries can look at and say, if Germany can do this, why can't we do it? What is Germany doing? And I'm not just picking yeah. Germany out by itself. There are others that are certainly in that uh, same situation. But uh, Rick MacArthur, these are very important issues. They're very vital. And of course, they're not issues that we could dissect and come up with uh, all kinds of recommendations in a matter of 26 minutes. But I do want to thank you so very much for bringing sure. these to, to our attention. And what we'll have to do at another point in time is to come back and focus more intensely, perhaps on the 2003 war or on trade. But again, I want to thank you for a very interesting very and much. a very informative Thanks. program. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you.
I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.